Hi everybody, this is Dr. Anna, your geology professor. Today's topic is the Cenozoic. This is our very last chapter, so this is it. I hope you enjoyed all the other chapters and you didn't mind learning about the Earth history. Uh, and I really hope that you're going to enjoy the Cenozoic to learn about the Cenozoic also. The Cenozoic is an interesting time period. It's really the most interesting for us because this is when humans came around. It basically uh, talking about the last 66 million years of the Earth history. This, la this picture represents the whole Earth history right here. This is all the 4.6 billion years. It's amazing to see that most of the 4.6 billion years history is, is uh, the Archean and the Proterozoic. The light blue is the Archean and the darker blue is the Proterozoic. So this basically is 4.1 billion years here. And the brown area shows the last 540 million years, which is the Phanerozoic, as you know. The very light brown is the Paleozoic from Cambrian all the way to the Permian. The darker brown is the Triassic to Cretaceous. And the darkest brown right here is the last 66 million years, which is the Cenozoic. Here is the, the more detailed divisions of the Cenozoic. The two big divisions is the tertiary and the quaternary. Tertiary is the 66 to 2 million years ago, and quaternary includes the last 2 million years of Earth history. So let's start with the plate tectonics. Um, Remember, we left off at the end of the Cretaceous saying that the continents have moved away from the Pangean position uh, relatively close to the today's position. The last 66 million years went with the continents moving to exact today's position. So this here is the first one showing the, the end of the Cretaceous uh, position of the continents. Uh, as you can see here, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge got uh, pretty much established. The India started to move up, almost got to the equator. Australia and Antarctica are pretty much still together. And uh, we have started to see the, the breaking off of uh, Greenland from North America. And this here shows the Paleocene, 60 million years ago, geography. Um, probably one of the most important events which happened during this time is that Australia and Antarctica started to break away from each other. Uh, basically, after the rifting here, uh, Australia started to move north to its present-day uh, location. And as actually uh, Antarctica this ocean started to grow, Antarctica started to move down south to its present day location, which is exactly on the, on the South Pole. As soon as you have a continent at the, at the pole, uh, ice age is set up. And later on, we're going to talk about in more details, but to have an ice age, there has to be a continent at the pole. So we're going to talk about that later. Um, this is the time. This is the, the Miocene when the continental rifting started in East Africa. I have a more detailed slide right here. So this shows the triple junction right here in East Africa. Uh, the three arms of this triple junction is the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the East African Rift Basin, which, which includes this whole zone right here. The oldest oceanic crust is the, the Gulf of Aden. It has Miocene oceanic crust. The Red Sea is a little bit younger. It has Pliocene oceanic crust. And the East African Reef Basin is still, the, the, the crust is still, still thinning there, but it doesn't have oceanic crust. Scientists do believe that this is the, the arm of the triple junction, which is never going to make it into ocean. So it's going to be the so-called failed arm of this system. Uh, there is a very active subduction going on around the Circum-Pacific belt, uh, which includes the western part of North America and next to east, next to Japan. This is a very interesting slide. This shows the, the, the 
amount of ice on Earth 18,000 years ago. You can see that a lot of North America was under ice. Basically, Virginia was ice-free, but very, very close to the ice, as you can see right there. Uh, a lot of Europe was under ice, and as you can see, Greenland, Iceland was all, all under ice. And the ice cap around Antarctica was much bigger than it is today. And actually, it's easy to compare because here is the today's world, right there. As you can see that the ice around Antarctica is much, much smaller. Most of North America, the ice on most of North America has melted. We still have a little bit left in um, northern Canada, Greenland, Iceland is under some ice. So we still have continental ice. So we definitely are in an ice age still. And now we have to talk about the orogenic belts. We have two major ones, the Alpine Himalaya and the Circum Pacific. So here is the Alpine Himalaya right here between uh, Africa and Europe and India. You know, Himalaya is like above India and, and uh, in between India and Asia. And the Circum Pacific is around the Pacific Ocean right here. So let's start with, with the Alpine Himalaya. The reason for the Alpine Himalaya mobile belt is the closing of the, the Mesozoic uh, huge ocean, the Tethys. Uh, Africa and Europe is colliding, uh, and that's why the Alpine mountain is forming. Don't forget the Alps is not only in Europe, but also this mountain region is uh, located also in North, North Africa. Uh, the Himalaya is mostly because of India colliding with Asia. This, or, uh, this, this whole belt is characterized with very tall mountains. They are very sharp, very young, and there's a lot of uh, sedimentation going on around it. This shows you actually the Alps. As you can see, it's the Alpine mountain itself is in Europe. It's including a little bit of France, uh, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and uh, Turkey, Greece, and this area. This is a satellite picture of the Alps. And there's a couple of close-ups. As you can see, they are really ragged, very sharp mountains, which tells you that they are really, really young. Now, what tells you that if, if a... Uh, if a belt is still active, if an orogenic belt is still active, you have to have a bunch of earthquakes and you have to have active volcanoes. And actually on this slide, you can see this is Greece right here, this is Italy, and the red triangles are all active, relatively active volcanoes. The, the Greece ones haven't uh, erupted lately, but as you know, the, the, the Etna and the Stromboli are active almost all the time. The Vesuvius has been active in the last 2,000 years also. So we have a whole lot of earthquakes and we have active volcanoes. So this whole region is still very, very, very active. And that shows the Himalaya satellite picture. And it shows that the Himalaya formed by India colliding into Asia. This is the tallest mountain on Earth. Um, and the tallest peak, as you know, the Mount Everest, it's 8,848 meter. There is a tremendous amount of, of sedimentation, erosion, and deposition around the Himalaya mountains. And you know that this region is still very active because we have a whole lot of really, really big earthquakes around here. We have this figure here which shows the movement of India from 68 million years ago. At the beginning, India moved very, very fast, usually 15 to 30 centimeters per year, which is really, really fast. But uh, about, about 40 to 50 million years ago, actually, it started to collide into Asia, and this, this speed abruptly uh, went down to 5 centimeters per year. We know that that is the time when actually it, it started to hit Asia. So that's why the very abrupt change in the speed. Uh, and this slide just shows you the, the formation of the whole mountain. As you can see, there is a lot of crust faults. 
so the the pieces of the crust could move up and up higher and this is how the Tatian limestone have went up so 8,000 meter high on top of the Himalaya you can you can find Triassic and Jurassic uh, bivalve clams fossils on the top of the Himalaya mountain and the reason for that is that it went up on this trust faults uh, from the Tethys Ocean, the sediment from the Tethys Ocean. And this is just a very nice looking picture uh, from the Himalayas. Let's move to the Circum-Pacific Orogenic Belt. This is everywhere around the, uh, around the Pacific Ocean. The triangle shows you all the volcanoes. These are all basically active volcanoes. Um, so this whole area is very, very, very active. And you know we have a lot of earthquakes around here too. So what's going on in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, it has been consumed at the subduction zones all along the, the Pacific Ocean. It's really interesting though because on the west side of the Pacific Ocean we have oceanic, oceanic plate boundaries. But on the east side they are mostly oceanic continental plate boundaries like the Andes Mountains, you know, in Washington and Oregon we have in North America. It's also oceanic continental plate boundary. Okay, now we're going to go region by region, starting with the Gulf Coastal region, actually. Uh, after the final withdrawal of the Cretaceous Seaway, the Zuni, in the Cenozoic, there was another brief period of, of transgression. So we had another Epiric Sea, which is the Taya sequence. And um, this seaway, however, was not very big. It was just rest restricted to the Gulf, Gulf Coast Plain and um, in the Mississippi Valley. And its maximum level, which was in the early tertiary, it extended all the way up to southern Illinois. So you have to imagine that the whole Mississippi Valley area has been under water. And actually, this seaway was pretty periodic. So you have to imagine that the, the seaway moved up and down. And to the left was the, the Rocky Mountains, and to the right was the, the Appalachian. So the sediment went into this seaway cyclically through time. So you have to imagine basically this whole area looked just like the Gulf of Mexico today. So it had a lot of uh, rivers bringing sediment into it uh, by delta sequences. And we kind of have talked about that the delta progradation is really important because that is uh, making a lot of important sedimentation which is very important for the oil industry because it does a lot of oil traps we're going to talk about in just one minute. So this is actually the time when we're talking about oil and oil formation. But before I start it, let me stop this one so I can 